Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. Is it ever tempting to say, okay, I want to go back to the motherland. St. Louis is great, but this is not the same as being 100% around my people. Every day. Here, I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, Over there, I'm also a citizen. I'm a dual citizen. Uh, Here, I'm a Bosnian um, every once in a while. They have a very shared shared almost soul that, that that I have I'm not sure how to describe it it's it's a yeah. strange feeling it's almost like you're 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 watching a, a horror movie but you can't look away <laughs> cuz you're part of the horror movie I'm Sarah Fenske Tomorrow, Fontbonne University opens its new Center for Bosnian Studies. It's appropriate timing. On that date, 30 years ago, Bosnia and Herzegovina voted to create an independent state. That set off violent attacks from Serbia-backed forces and ultimately the Bosnian War. March 1st remains a national holiday. It's the Independence Day of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Center for Bosnian Studies at Fontbonne is new, but the work being done there is not. Fontbonne professor Benjamin Moore founded the Bosnian Memory Project in 2006, and now this new name reflects its increasing role as a hub of knowledge and resources on Bosnia. And joining us today to tell us more is Adna Karamejic Oates. She is director of the Center for Bosnian Studies. Adna, welcome. Thank you, Sarah. It's very nice to be here. Mm. And we're also joined today by Bahidin Pirich. He's an Arnold resident. He's a survivor of the Shrey Benitsa massacre. And he's a student at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. He's also a former intern for the Bosnian Memory Project. Bahidin, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Anna, let's start with you. What was the original idea at Fontbonne for this Bosnian Memory Project that started this whole thing that today now is getting a new name? Yes, thanks for, uh, again, thank you for having uh, me here and for the opportunity to tell you about the Center for Bosnian Studies. So it really all began uh, back in 2006 uh, when students and faculty, uh, Benjamin Moore, as you mentioned in your introduction, um, started interacting with uh, Bosnian refugees in St. Louis in their everyday life and recognizing that, you know, these are people that have come with Uh, really uh, uh, sort of difficult um, stories, difficult experiences, and um, that it was important to record um, and preserve those histories. Um, You know, they they were sort of bringing with them um, a story of intolerance, um, and uh, that was important for future generations of of, uh, young Bosnian Americans, um, as well as for researchers that wanted to study how these things come about and, and what they result in. And am I right in thinking Benjamin Moore, he was in, in the English slash communications department? Yes, yes, he was um, uh, in the English department. And uh, really him and uh, another professor, Dr. Jack Lusko, who um, is a historian, but also um, a, a scholar of genocide, um, came together and started this project of recording the oral histories of survivors um, and their families, uh, wanting to preserve those stories, um, like I mentioned. So this seems like such important work, and and yet it seems kind of crazy to look back and think, at that point it was 2006, you Mm -hmm. know, this had been a a while ago at that point, and this is this smaller Catholic university, um, an English professor kind of just, you know, started realizing these stories weren't being preserved. Observed. Nobody was, was doing a systemic job of, of getting these oral histories down at that point. Nobody was doing that in St. Louis. Um, you know, I think Fontbonne's mission uh, 
really is also to educate uh, students to be global citizens um, that are working towards the common good. So I think it really aligned with the mission of Fontbonne University as well. Um, and that's why they were supportive from the very beginning of the Bosnia Memory Project and of, of uh, Ben's initiative to bring that to Fontbonne and to, to move it forward. And so has it been since its founding primarily uh, getting down these oral histories, interviewing people? Yes, that was the core, that has always been the core work of the Bosnia Memory Project. So recording, um, interviewing and recording oral histories of uh, the survivors and of their families. And uh, at that point, through speaking with them, um, the project also started collecting artifacts, so documents, photographs, letters that really represent that whole experience uh, of, of living, surviving through some of the worst things a person should, could, you know, should ever have to live through, um, and then the process of migrating to the U.S. So it also started a project of ar- excuse me, archiving um, those materials, um, and that's what... Uh, the Bosnia Memory Project also has today this incredible and very unique and rare archive of, of history, oral histories, as well as um, artifacts from, from that time. Hmm. So, Bahidin, you are yourself a survivor from this conflict, came to the U.S. as a refugee. You also got a chance to work as an intern uh, back when this was still the Bosnian Memory Project. What, what kind of work did you get to do there? Uh, well, thank you first for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my work was working directly with the oral histories themselves. Uh, about 90% of the histories that were taken were in the Bosnian language. Uh, as a speaker of, of Bosnian, I would kind of catalog uh, everything in the hope that we, this could be preserved for future generations so they can learn about it, so they could uh, remember what the Bosnian people went through um, so it doesn't happen again. I think the whole time when I was doing this, my whole initiative to to do it was a, a kind of memorial, I guess, to my own people. Um, so it's it's remembered. So there's a lot of denial going on uh, about what's going, you know, what happened. Um, but I just uh, my my role was to to catalog everything and, and make sure it's accessible to everyone, not just historians. What was it like listening back? to these interviews that had been taken down. I imagine in some ways that had to be hard. It was very difficult. Um, a lot of these these interviews that we did, the histories that we did, that I did, that were already taken, uh, involved concentration camps, mass killings, um, mass rapes, um, and especially hit me hard in, in instances where I would be listening to something and they would mention a specific village that I know. Hey, my uncle was born there or my mom is from that village. Um, Or they mention a specific name that I might know or a specific, let's say, business where my dad was employed. Uh, So it's almost like I'm learning about my own history. And it's it's quite quite difficult. You, You hear some about some of these people that I have never met but I feel like I've I have met them. They have a very shared, shared almost soul that that, that I have. I'm not sure how to describe it. It's it's a yeah. strange feeling. It's almost like you're 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 watching a horror movie, but you can't look away because <laughs> you're part of the horror movie. I don't know what to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, is that something you can identify with? Hearing Vahidin's, um feelings, listening to these oral histories. Absolutely. And, you know, as he was speaking, uh, he was talking about, you know, the collective history. This is exactly what this is about. Um, And this is the reason that uh, the Bosnian Memory Project and now the Center for Bosnian Studies is so committed to preserving these stories because you have now in St. Louis second and third generation Bosnian Americans uh, for whom this is their history. This is their past. Um, And sometimes this is the way that they're learning about that history in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, So in addition to making these oral histories uh, accessible to researchers, to scholars, it's also for that younger generation that is in St. Louis and that is here to stay, right? This is their home now. 
So these interviews, um, Adna, you were kind enough to share an excerpt of one that we're going to share with you all today. So this is the center recorded this interview with a Bosnian Muslim who was living in an area with significant ethnic cleansing. He tried to flee the attack on his town, and he was captured. And like thousands of men and boys, he was taken to a concentration camp. He survived two different notorious camps. And in this clip, he talks about his experience. You're going to hear his voice along with a translator for the Bosnian Memory Project. During night, they were taking them to kill. The first month, they were calling their names. People didn't know why they are calling them for. Because they were lying them that they are going to exchange them. But they were killing them. And after that, we made a deal. Nobody is going to answer when they call names. And that is a Muslim man who survived the Bosnian genocide. This was recorded by the Bosnian Memory Project in 2013. Now, Adna, I understand he died six years after that interview in 2019, and that this is the only interview that documents his experience. Is that unusual? Unfortunately, it's not unusual um, that uh, we are facing the reality of that generation that survived, that is now aging, um, and we are really sort of desperate to record as many of those stories as we can because we're worried that those stories will never be told. And are people often eager to tell these stories, or does it take a little bit of, uh, you know, helping them understand why you're after this? Yeah, Yeah, I would say it depends. Um, You know, some people are eager to share their story. Others are are very reluctant, and it takes time to build up the trust to explain, um, because it's also for them, you know, as you can imagine, reliving some things uh, again, and it's difficult to share. Um, So we have had many such interviews where it's difficult um, and we stop and start again, um, but we're committed to continuing um, that with the Center uh, for Bosnian Studies. Behedin, in these interviews, as, as you're listening to them, are there any sort of common themes or things that have struck you um, just from the totality of the ones you've listened to? Uh, one thing that, uh, a question that we ask at, at the end of each interview is, what do you want future generations to, to know about what happened now? I think that's that's what we ask every interviewee. Um, a large majority of them just want people to remember what happened and to make sure it doesn't happen again, not just in Bosnia, but anywhere else in the, in the, in the world. Um, doesn't matter if if they're you know Muslims are being killed, Christians are being killed, uh, Jews are being killed, whatever it may be. Just there is a large majority of of survivors, such as myself, just want to make sure what happened in in our country doesn't happen to anyone else ever again. I know that's a common refrain from people telling these stories. It is absolutely, and I think this is one of the really amazing things about listening to these stories, that despite the horror um, and uh, really tragedy that these people have been through, um, they have started new lives and are absolutely committed to not seeing the same things happen and educating others um, and sharing their stories for that reason. Um, And that's really what the Center for Bosnian Studies is ultimately about, to counter that narrative of hate and discrimination that fueled the war and genocide in Bosnia, but that is at the root of so many conflicts um, that we see around the world. We're talking today to Adna Karameyich Oates. She's the director of the Center for Bosnian Studies at Fompon University. That opens tomorrow. They have been doing that work there since 2006 as the Bosnian Memory Project. As of tomorrow, they get a new name to reflect the increased mandate um, and increased commitment to this project going forward. We're also joined by Bahidin Piric. He's a survivor of the Srebrenica massacre. He's a current student at UMSL, has also been an intern for this project. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be back shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio.
Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. We're discussing the opening of the new Center for Bosnian Studies at Fompon University. It's a longtime project of the university. Now it's officially getting a new name, uh, working on all kinds of, of efforts to get oral histories from people who survived what happened in Bosnia, many of them who are here in St. Louis. We're joined today by Adna Karameyic Oates. She's director of the Center for Bosnian Studies at Fompon. We're also joined by Behedin Pirich. He's a survivor of the Srebrenica massacre. He's a current resident of Arnold and a student at UMSL. So, Behedin, I referred to your story now a couple times, the fact that, that you were born over in Eastern Europe. Um, you've said your first memory was being in the back of a UN truck. How old were you at that point? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but that is the first memory I have. Um, I think it's one of those UN trucks. I remember specifically um, there was a ripped up tarp on it, but it was kind of all destroyed. Um, I don't really know where we were going or what was going on. I just remember it being very crowded, a lot of people. Um, I think I was probably about three years old or you so. You were little. Very, very small. Like I said, it's the first me- memory I have. It was my family being pushed out of our home, uh, out of the, the city I was born, out of Srebrenica. And so you were able to flee that city. A whole lot of other people did not make it out. But uh, your parents and, and you, you were able to get out of there. Where did you go from there? Uh, yes, uh, my parents and I were able able to go, go out and leave. Uh, after that, we kind of floated around the country of Bosnia. The, our home was destroyed. Uh, there was no other place to go. A lot of the other institutions that could have helped us in Bosnia, they were destroyed, the government was destroyed. We ended making, a, uh, we ended up making our way to Croatia, to Zagreb, the capital, uh, where we sought refuge there. That was where we first became refugees outside of the country, and eventually we managed to come over here to the United States as refugees. And were you, you were formally resettled, like the, the UN chose where you went, you didn't, you didn't get to pick. Um, the organizations that were involved in our resettlement was uh, UNICEF and uh, the Lutheran Church, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of a strange thing. I don't think a lot of people know that they do that. Um, they try to resettle you to places where there could be other family members, so it's not like they're just dropping you into the unknown or where other people of your communities. Originally, we were resettled to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, my aunt was already living there, so it made more sense than just dropping us in a place like St. Louis. And yet, in so many ways, I mean, St. Louis ended up with a lot of Bosnian refugees that really formed a community here that, that was so helpful for, for future Bosnians who ended up getting settled here. Sioux Falls didn't have quite so many Bosnians there. No. Uh, <laughs> in total, there was... My family, my aunt, and about maybe 40 to 50 other Bosnian families. And when I say Bosnian, I mean I include Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, and Bosnian Muslims. Uh, I think here there there was a lot more, um, um, I guess, safeguarding of the culture, of the language, as in Sioux Falls, there there was none of those Bosnian places that you could go out, Bosnian stores. Uh, I think a lot of the culture for people who grew up in Sioux Falls was lost uh, compared to what people had here. And so you're there, you've been resettled there, Um, you're still a kid. Was it hard sort of being in this place where there weren't a ton of people speaking your language, people who understood what you'd come out of, any of that stuff? There was not. Originally when when we settled there, uh, I did not go to a regular school. I went to a school where it was specifically for Bosnian refugees and refugees from other nations. Uh, there were some people from Kosovo, a lot of African nations, some Asian nations. Uh, the real strange part is none of us spoke English, so we were just kind of there as a babysitting service just to kind of put a check mark in the box. We weren't actually learning anything. I myself struggled a lot in, in terms of reading and things like that. Uh, I did not 
fully comprehend how to read the English language until around the seventh grade.、Mm, that's got to be make it so hard to learn then any subject at that point. Yes,、um, I struggled with school a lot.、Um, And then when you would have you know parent teacher conferences where you would have letters, hey,、uh, he's failing this class. He's failing. My parents didn't didn't understand that,、um, and they would just let us go to the next grade. So eventually, I got to the seventh grade where、um, I met a teacher.、Uh, his name was Mr. Van Buren, who actually cared, and he introduced me to、um, to reading. And I started out reading little picture books, and then.、Uh, Hardy Boys, and then War of the Worlds, and as I got better and better, I I, I started to to love the English language. I, I write a lot to to love the written word, and that's kind of what drew me to the oral histories. By、um, where eventually I, I became an intern. So it, it was a rough rough start for you in this country. You were able to find your way for your parents. Were they able to get the support they needed to to learn English or to just find the life that they needed here? Uh, my parents came over,、um, kind of in, in. They had just established their life in the in Bosnia. They had just built a new home. We were actually in the process of moving in, and that was all destroyed. So coming here again, it was almost like having to establish a whole new life. No language, no nothing, in terms of support. The Lutheran social services. There was some classes offered in、uh, English. But the main issue there was there was really no one to to teach it.、Uh, there was not a lot of people who knew English and were also Bosnian.、Uh, my father Ahmo, he came over、um, heavily wounded from a from an explosion of a mine、um, when he was trying to get food. So the first few years that he was in the country was spent in and out of surgeries.、Mm. There was a few times where he had blood poisoning and things like that, just from the shrapnel that it was in his body. But somehow they managed working a lot of jobs.、Um, my dad used to go into and work with with crutches, you know.、Mm. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely tough. And now this story.、Um, each family, I imagine, has a story, and each story is difficult in its own way. It is. I mean, every Bosnian that has come to St. Louis has their own story.、Um, and I was, as I was listening to Behidin, you know, he was talking about the difficulties of the children, of the parents. They each have their own hardships, right? For the children, they were often in situations where, if they were learning English in school, they were in the position of having to help their parents. Understand documents that were coming in the mail that had to do with social security. They would have to translate for them, or to make appointments with a doctor, they would have to be calling the doctor on、you、behalf of the. Grow up so fast! It is an incredible sort of jump in having to mature in such a short time and take on those responsibilities, and obviously very difficult for the parents. You know, there is a lot of people that came with. Higher levels of education, professionals that came to the United States and weren't able to continue doing those highly skilled jobs, you know, doctors and lawyers, who then had to completely switch careers、um, because of the language issues、um, and do much, much lower, obviously, skilled jobs. But I would say over time.、Um, The Bosnian community in St. Louis has also really sort of experienced mobility in many different ways.、Um, when they arrived, you know, I would say Midwest Bank Center was one of the was the bank that was supporting、uh, Bosnians to get loans and credit for housing,、um, and that was so important、mm -hmm. for people to get back onto their feet.、Um, and Midwest is the lead sponsor of the Center for Bosnian Studies as well. Because they recognize sort of the value of this work and the value of the community, and want to keep supporting the community,、um, so、uh, we are seeing now Bosnians, Bosnian Americans in all sectors of the economy, thanks to、um, this time and、uh, the mobility that they have experienced. And this has been, I think, every this is the one thing everyone in St. Louis can agree on. I think literally everyone in St. Louis. I'm sure there's some exception out there, but that this has been such a good thing for St. Louis to have this Bosnian community here.、Uh, Vihidin, you you know you're in Sioux Falls. At what point did you decide? Okay, I I want to be in St. Louis. Well, in Sioux Falls, I was regularly visiting St. Louis due to the the absence of culture up in Sioux Falls.、Um, I would. 
be here every like two weeks. We would, my whole family would drive here, go to the store. Uh, when we decided to move here was very much due to the reasons that Adna just said. There was a lot of more Bosnian opportunity for business, for whatever you needed, for religion, for, for culture. We decided to move about six years ago. Um, there's a lot of Bosnian trucking, like semi-truck companies here. Uh, that's what uh, what Bosnian, uh, what my dad uh, does, my brothers. Uh, there's a whole kind of inside joke. If you're Bosnian, you have to own a semi-truck company. <laughs> <laughs> They've done very well in that business. Yes. That's, that's great. Yes. Yeah. But I think some people might wonder, I mean, now that things are better in Bosnia, is it ever tempting to say, okay, I want to go back to the motherland. St. Louis is great, but this is not the same as being 100% around my people. Every day. <laughs> I think for me it's every day. Um, there's this sense where here I, I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, over there I'm also a citizen. I'm a dual citizen. Uh, here I'm a Bosnian um, every once in a while. I mean, you, you can probably tell I have an accent when I go to Bosnia speaking Bosnian, but I have an accent. Um, and I think that's that's the shared history of all refugees. You don't belong in either, either country. Once you become a refugee, even if you settle somewhere else, I think you're a refugee mm -hmm. forever. So definitely I did try to go back to Bosnia, but there's a lot of, lot of um, hardship over there still, uh, especially the place where I'm from, which belongs to the Republika Srpska now, which is the entity of, of Bosnian Serbs, where I wasn't even able to to really set up any type of um, terms of identity cards, you know, IDs. They're just not allowing that at this point for me mm -hmm. um, and for a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. So, so many refugees, um, as uh, the Heaton said, you know, you leave your home, you're changed by that. You can't just go home. We're seeing this again in Europe with what's happening in Ukraine. So many people being uprooted, having to flee their homes. Adna, are there lessons we can learn from what happened in this conflict in the 90s um, that apply to, to what's happening over there today? Well, it is. The, the images are certainly very familiar, I think. You know, you see a people an innocent people that whose lives are being absolutely uprooted because of the pure aggression and belligerence of another nation. Um, and, you know, uh, we have been here, we have been there, we recognize that pain and really empathize with everything that Ukrainian people are going through. Um, I think it is absolutely uh, critical to learn from the Bosnians' experience to support what Bahidin was saying, the if we are host to new refugees, to support them in restarting their life. Um, and it's through very basic things, uh, such as driving them to appointments, um, translating documents for them, just being there in any way we can for them as they try to restart their life. Mm -hmm. So, Edna, this, uh, you're now the Center for Bosnian Studies as of tomorrow, no longer just the Bosnian Memory Project. What do you see as, as some of the uh, – what, what does that bring, I guess, that you couldn't do as the Bosnian Memory Project now that you have this center? Well, you know, we always envisioned uh, a place in St. Louis uh, that would be a permanent presence uh, about the Bosnian community um, and that would be a resource about the Bosnian community for the younger generation and for scholars. Um, so I think now that we have a space, uh, a perma that permanent presence, we can expand. We are uh, definitely planning to expand our oral history collection. Um, we're planning to con continue raising awareness. Um, we work uh, closely with the Missouri History Museum um, to sort of spread knowledge about what happened and again, to continue fighting against that uh, narrative of, of hate and discrimination and teach people this is what, you know, genocide can result in some of these narratives. And we need to we need to stand together against it. So it's been so exciting to hear uh, this work. But Behedin, I have to end with you today, because I'm curious about your personal story. You've been able to, to tell us just some glimpses of your life. Um, now that you've done this work with the Bosnian Memory Project, and, and you've been so engrossed in these interviews, 
Are you planning to join the family business, get into mm-hmm. trucking, or do you see your future being more along the lines of, of this kind of work? Um, get into trucking? No, I don't have the, the nerves to drive a 56 <laughs> foot truck semi. It's a hard uh, job. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's even more difficult than, than what I'm more interested in is writing. I think both my work, I've definitely feel like I've gotten closest, closer to my, my, uh, my roots, my community. Um, and I think it would be a, a big waste of my resources and my efforts and what I can kind of uh, do personally to not keep up with the work that I've been doing, to uh, write, to um, speak to people about it, to do whatever I can, to be a platform for for the Bosnian people and for what happened and to be a platform for other people, such as the people that you mentioned who, in Ukraine who I've been watching very closely with my family and it's just the similarities are, are everywhere and and it's you just feel hopeless and I, and I and I feel like we just need to talk about it more and, and see if we can get some sort of action you know we need action that's the thing that was lacking in Bosnia was action there was a lot of talk and a lot of words but there was no action the world stood by yes exactly and you want to make sure that doesn't happen today yes that is definitely something that I want to try to try to help out with uh, as you said as my grandfather and grandmother were being murdered and countless cousins were being murdered and thrown into ditches People were, were debating on if it was happening or not, or why was it happening when, when we just need to make a stand. We need to do something. We can't just talk about it. Well, Bahidin Peric, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And Bahidin is a survivor of the Srebrenica massacre. He's an UMSL student who lives in Arnold. Um, and Adna Karameyich Oates, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And Adna is the director of the Center for Bosnian Studies that opens at Fompon University tomorrow. Such good work going on there. We're excited to hear the, the renewed commitment. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, Honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.